Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Site for White, welcoming you to this week's Talking News on Saturday the 20th of May 2023. This week I attended another event involved in the Inclusive Island Project. This is a project being run by the Isle of Wight Council to try and bring organisations together in order to create an inclusive island. The first area that they are concentrating on is employment and education. I attended the conference and was able to put valuable input into ideas that are being floated around about how to bring people together so that we recognise the ability, not the disability. I'll keep you posted. A huge thank you and shout out for our volunteers, some of whom attended the bucket collection last week, raising funds for the charity, and some of whom are today at the Riverside event in Newport. These outside events are very important about raising awareness of the charity as much as raising funds for the charity. So if you are able to ever help, don't hesitate to contact Susan on 52205 and I'm sure she can find an event for you to attend on our behalf. The sun seems to finally be shining, so everybody enjoy. Thank you, Lisa, CEO, Site for White. This is Chris reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight Chamber of Commerce Business Award winners announced for 2023. The winners of the Isle of Wight Chamber of Commerce Business Awards have been presented for 2023. Sponsored by White Fibre, the award ceremony took place on Friday, May the 12th at Cowes Yacht Haven. The glamorous and highly prestigious event was hosted by comedian and TV presenter Shapai Korsandi. The Isle of Wight is everyone's best kept secret, Shapi said. I love being here. It's my favourite place and it's so good to be able to celebrate with everyone here tonight. Thank you for having me. You've all been fabulous. Datum Electronics won the highly coveted Business of the Year Award, as well as Manufacturing and Export Business of the Year Award. In an emotional speech, Datum's Managing Director James Lees paid tribute to his East Cows team for their support in enabling record growth and turnover in 2022. White Fibre's John Irvine was presented with the President's Cup for outstanding contribution, reflecting the success of the Gigabyte Island project. White Fibre also won Customer Service Award and Employer of the Year Award. It was a strong night for the island's manufacturing sector, with key awards won by Yokogawa Marex, Vicoma International and Parlex Johnson Electric. The tourism and hospitality sector was also well represented too, with wins for Visit Isle of Wight, the Island Holiday Company, the Seaview Hotel and Restaurant and JR Zone. Stephen Holbrook, the Chamber's CEO, said, It's been another amazing night for the island's business community. We have some amazing nominees and winners tonight, and it's a huge thrill to see so many great businesses celebrating in each other's success. There are so many great stories here, but as ever, the big winner is the Isle of Wight, where island businesses are thriving. The Startup Business of the Year Award went to the Island Holiday Company. Entrepreneurship Award, the winner was Jay Arzone and presented by Sandra Knowles. Made on the Isle of Wight Award, went to Visit Isle of Wight. Community Award was won by Tidal Family Support. Customer Service Award went to White Fibre. Training and Development Award was went to Yoko Gawa Marex. The Environment and Sustainability Award was won by Vicoma International Limited. Hospitality and Tourism Business of the Year Award was won by the Seaview Hotel and Restaurant. 
Technology and Innovation Award went to Parlex Johnson Electric. The Employer of the Year Award was White Fibre. Manufacturing and Export Business of the Year Award went to Datum Electronics. Growth Business of the Year Award was won by JR Zone. Business Social Impact Award went to Medina Publishing Limited. Micro Business of the Year Award went to Wed and Prosper. The Small Business of the Year Award went to Captiva Homes. Member of the Year Award was won by WRS Systems. President's Cup for Outstanding Contribution went to John Irvine of White Fibre. And the Business of the Year Award went to Datum Electronics. This is Brian reading an article from the Island Echo. Balance of power shifts at Isle of Wight Council after mass defections. The Isle of Wight Council ruling administration has suffered another blow after two more councillors, including an executive leader, jumped ship to form a new group. The Empowering Islanders group has last week, Friday the 12th of May, been created on the Isle of Wight Council, with members Councillor Dave Adams, Councillor Chris Jarman, Councillor John Medland and Councillor Peter Spink. Two members, councillors Adams and Jarman, are the latest to leave the Alliance Group, meaning it has lost four councillors in one week. It means the Conservatives are now the biggest group on the Isle of Wight Council. The party has now has three more councillors than the ruling Alliance administration. Empowering Islanders is now the third biggest group on the authority, ahead of the Liberal Democrats, who now have three seats after Councillor Michael Lilly joined them earlier this week. Councillor Jarman, who has been part of the council since May 2021, has been appointed leader of the group. He currently holds one of the most important portfolios on the council's cabinet in charge of the authority's finances. Councillor Spink last week left the Conservative Party at County Hall originally saying he would stand as an independent Conservative before joining Empowering Islanders. Councillor Medlin confirmed his resignation from the Alliance today after saying he had some doubts for some time and did not like how divided the Council was, feeling more could be done if they worked together as a whole for the island's interest. Councillor Medland, who represents Freshwater South, has taken a bit of a gamble and left what he called a good experiment. However, speaking about the way different political factions interact at County Hall, he said, We're always knocking lumps out of each other and not working together. I hope by shifting to the middle ground, I can make a place where councillors can work as a whole for the island's interest. Councillor Medland, who will lose his position as chair of the planning committee, went on to say, The way the council is working is awful, divided. I know it is normal politics, but I'm not that way inclined. I would prefer us to work as a team. The council faces enormous problems right now. We're losing our young people, a huge housing crisis. There's so much we have to worry about. Group politics gets in the way, and we are not concentrating on solving the problems. We are criticising each other. In a statement issued after the resignation of Councillor Medland, Councillor Jonathan Bacon, the Alliance's spokesperson, said he knew of the intent to form a new group, but that the councillors had indicated they did not wish to see the council leadership change. At that time, he said he had no concerns over recent exit and called it a very small storm in an insignificant teacup. Councillor Bacon has been contacted for an updated comment. On the Isle of Wight Council, there are now 16 Conservative councillors, 13 Alliance members who are either independent or the Green Party, 
four empowering islanders, three Liberal Democrats, one Labour member, one independent Labour, and an independent councillor, councillor Darrell Pit Pitcher, who was jailed for historic child sex offences last month. Health and safety fail. 84% of businesses discovered breaking the law in unannounced inspections. From the Island Echo, read by Joyce. A staggering 84% of Isle of Wight businesses checked during a recent inspection push by the Health and Safety Executive were found to have breached the law, resulting in four prohibition notices being served. The Health and Safety Executive, HSE, carried out a special two-day inspection programme on the island last week and found that out of the 33 businesses visited without notice, 84% were in breach of vital health and safety regulations. Issues found included badly maintained electrics, unguarded machinery, work at height taking place unsafely, lack of control of exposure to wood dust, welding fume or other substances hazardous to health, and poor welfare facilities. Companies checked range from small businesses to large industry leading firms with hundreds of employees. The team of 11 inspectors visited 33 properties and issued four prohibition notices, 37 improvement notices and numerous instances of written advice. Nancy Harmon, HSC Principal Inspector, who led the project, has said, Although we did identify some good practice on the Isle of Wight, there were numerous areas where risks to health and safety were not being properly managed and where improvements were needed. As a result of our intervention, we hope to have educated and informed businesses about the measures that they need to have in place to ensure that everyone goes home from work safely and without risks to their health. This inspection programme forms part of our ongoing work on the Isle of Wight and across Hampshire, and we will be following up on the premises we visited and others in the following months. By concentrating our resources at the same time, it allowed us to be more efficient in making sure businesses are putting good control measures in place and that the health and safety of workers is at the top of the agenda for everyone. The last large-scale inspection visit like this to the Isle of Wight took place in 2019, before the Covid pandemic. This article is from the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Howard, and is to do with the proposed closure of a Sandown tourist attraction. The Isle of Wight Council is looking to secure the future of the tourist attraction. We now know one partner will manage its fossil collection, while a commercial partner will run the museum itself. A joint working agreement is being drawn up. Councillor Jonathan Bacon, Isle of Wight Council's Cabinet Member for the Environment and Heritage, told a meeting the museum's future is part of the wider regeneration bid for the area. It could see new attractions for Culver Parade, with Dinosaur Isle the key to success, said Councillor Bacon. The building needs repairs and will cost nearly £1 million to fix. Meanwhile, the Isle of Wight Council lost an estimated £417,700 between 2017 and 23. However, it's hoped it will break even in 2023-2024. The Council has applied for government funding. It will find out whether it's been successful in December. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Echo. Be more green. Festival set for end of May at Moor Green Reservoir Park. A new free community event supported by Cowes Town Council has been announced for Sunday the 28th of May, focused on the island's UNESCO biosphere status and sustainability. It's all happening between 10 a.m. and 5 o'clock on Moor Green Reservoir Park in Cowes.
with a free mini festival of fun for the whole family. There will be artist-led activities, entertainment, market stalls and more, all centred around the theme of the island's UNESCO biosphere status and sustainability, with loads to see and do, including wildlife discovery, bug hoovering, museum of nature, kids' crafts, arts activities, live music, fresh local food and more. UNESCO Biosphere Reserves are places that are chosen for their outstanding natural and cultural character and recognised as places where local communities have an aspiration to live sustainably within their local ecosystems. This is a global designation and in 2019 the Isle of Wight was awarded Biosphere Reserve status by the International Coordinating Council of UNESCO's Man and Biosphere Programme. There are 700 biosphere reserves worldwide, but the Isle of Wight is one of only seven in the UK. The event will kick off at 10 a.m. with B is for Biosphere a drop-in poster-making workshop with Kay McCran, lasting until 12.30. Meanwhile, Paul Armfield will be performing songs about trees beneath the trees at the woodland for half an hour from 10.30 and again at 15.30. Kay McCran will also be leading Dirty Drawing. In the Dirt with the dirt and about the dirt. Another drop-in workshop shop will take place between 1.30 and 4 o'clock. There will also be a number of all-day drop-in activities, including I Watch Wildlife Workshop, More Green Mural Upgrade Workshop with Alice Malia, Kite making and nature crafts with wilder learning, giant colouring in with Polly Zandari, history and nature workshops with Holly Medland, the pop up natural history museum with the common space and allotment tours. Cows Baptist Church will be open between 10.30 and 11.30 for all age celebration service for Pentecost Sunday and will be staying open until five o'clock where they'll be serving tea, coffee and cakes as well as some all essential toilet facilities for the day including baby changing facilities. There will also be traders for the first time at Moor Green Reservoir Park, including Black Gang Bakes, Andy Fortune Wood Turner, The Flying Coffee Machine, Cycle White and lots of handcrafted items, local produce and art. The event is on Moor Green Road in Cowes, located between the allotments and the Cowes Baptist Church. P.O. 317A.H. Look out for the big gates upon entry where there will be some beautiful decorations on loan from the brilliant Shade Makers. This is Brian reading an item from Isle of Wight Radio. Incredible Walk the White raises over £340,000 for Mountbatten. More than 7,800 walkers took part in Sunday's Walk the White, which has already raised over £340,000 for Mountbatten. Participation in Mountbatten's flagship fundraiser returned to pre-COVID levels, nearly double the number of walkers compared to last year's event. It was simply amazing, an absolute joy to be part of and to see so many people come together for Mountbatten, said CEO Nigel Hartley, who walked all 26.5 miles from Bembridge to the Needles. Walk the White was very much back to its best, and we're so grateful to everyone involved in the day. 
In these challenging times, the money raised so far is simply incredible and will help us so much in supporting people who need our care on the island. It is a huge task to organise the walk and I would like to personally thank our staff, volunteers and all our community supporters and sponsors who helped to make it happen. Thank you to you all for a truly memorable day. Walkers had the choice of four different routes, the full 26.5 miles, either the first or second half, or the eight mile flat walk. The schools walk the white from Freshwater Bay to the Needles also welcomed more than a thousand walkers and has so far raised around 30,000 pounds towards the overall total. More sponsorship money is still to be collected and the final total raise will be announced later in the year. Next year's event will take place on Sunday the 12th of May 2024. Lancaster Bomber to make Isle of Wight Armed Forces Day fly past. From the Island Echo, read by Joyce. Isle of Wight Armed Forces Day will be graced by one of the only airworthy Lancaster Bombers, on Sunday the 25th of June. Following this week's 80th year anniversary of the famous Dambusters raid, it's been confirmed the Lancaster Bomber will be performing a flypast in Ride. Armed Forces Day Committee Chair and Isle of Wight Armed Forces Champion, Councillor Ian Dawe said, This has taken six months of patience, sleepless nights, and being very nice on the phone, but the hard work has paid off and we are there. My pen was quivering this week as I signed off the agreement for the fly past. It was squared away a few hours before the crews would be kitting up for the famous Dambusters raid 80 years ago. You can't help but get goosebumps. The history, the heritage, the heroism, what a feeling. In a week that has seen the anniversary of that raid, to have the paperwork dripping in ink is something of a major coup for the island. Eighty years ago, on the night of 16th and 17th May 1943, Wing Commander Guy Gibson led 617 Squadron of the Royal Air Force on an audacious bombing raid into the industrial heartland of Germany. Operation Chastise saw 19 Lancasters, crewed by 133 airmen, attack three dams in the Ruhr Valley, and history was made. Lancaster PA 474 is one of the only two Lancasters that are still airworthy in the world. 7,377 were built. It is flown and maintained by the RAF's Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Councillor Dorr added, The Lank is an aircraft that evokes such emotion and admiration, linking us back to past aviation and reminding us of its pivotal role in World War II. I would humbly suggest that its appearance at Armed Force Day is made even more poignant given that there are now no remaining members of 617 Squadron alive. As it cruises aloft the glorious seafront in Ride, respect will be paid to those that made the ultimate sacrifice, as well as to those that are serving now. From my recollection, the last time the Lancaster officially displayed here was in 2013 over Cowes, so it's going to be something for the memory books. The Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Plane, PA-474, will be seen off Ride Seafront as part of the Armed Forces Day event on Sunday the 25th of June. Follow the updates at www.isleofwhitearmedforcesday.co.uk This article is from Isle of Wight Radio to do with vintage buses coming to ride a bus event this weekend. Vintage buses and coaches can be seen in and around ride at the ride a bus event this weekend, that's May 20th and 21st. Organised by the Isle of Wight Bus and Coach Museum, it's the first major event of the 2023 season 
and has been deservedly popular in previous years. Once again, buses will serve the Isle of Wight Donkey Sanctuary in Roxall, where visitors can park free of charge and receive a friendly welcome. The preserved buses will operate special free services, linking the park and ride site with the bus museum in ride and other attractions. Services 1A and 1B serve Wooden Station of the Isle of Wight Steam Railway. A commemorative programme is available containing full timetables and other helpful information. Doors open at 10am on both days. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Echo. Tashi Lunpo monks returned to key arts in July. The Tashi Lumpo monks will return to Key Arts on Saturday the 1st and Sunday the 2nd of July with their sellout show to celebrate their 50th anniversary. The show offers an insight into the mystical world of Tibet, featuring traditional Tibetan musical instruments, the sound of sacred mantras and elaborate colourful costumes. The performance is accompanied by an explanation of the significance and stories behind the dances and prayers and provides a fascinating glimpse into an ancient cultural tradition, far removed from modern Western society. Alongside the performances, the monks offer interactive workshops inviting participants to learn more about the costumes, performance and music of a Tibetan monastery or to try their hand at some of the Tibetan arts of butter sculpture, prayer flag printing or sand mandala making. The tantric tradition of meditation is exemplified by the construction of intricate sand mandalas. For nearly 500 years since Tashi Lumpo Monastery was founded in Tibet by the first Dalai Lama, the unique Buddhist tradition of prayers, tantric rituals, music and dance has been offered by monks inaccessible to all but the most fortunate. 50 years ago, forced from their homeland by the Chinese occupation of Tibet, the monastery was re-established in India, where this great tradition continues in exile. Eight Tibetan monks are now able to mark the 50th anniversary of the rebuilding of their monastery in India and share this dazzling spiritual culture with audiences in the West in the power of compassion, a programme of masked dance, music and tantric ritual. The workshops will take place on Saturday the 1st and Sunday the 2nd of July at four o'clock, with tickets priced at £12 in advance and £14 while the show will take place on the same day with tickets priced at £16 in advance and £18 on the door. Doors will open at 6pm with the show starting at 8pm. Tickets can be booked at www.keyarts.org or through the box office on 01983 822 490. This is Brian reading an article from the island Echo. Lambretta Weekender returns for 22nd edition with scooter ride out and live music. After a hugely successful 21st anniversary, Lambretta Day is again running a two day event with a scooter ride out and entertainment on Saturday the 27th and Sunday the 28th of May 2023. Saturday's rider will be organised by the Isle of Wight Scooter Alliance, leaving at 1pm with the venue yet to be decided, and the usual rider leaving from Newclose Cricket Ground Newport on the Sunday also at 1pm. Scooters will be meeting at 12 noon and ride, riding to Ride Pavilion Bar for free live music, DJs, beer tent and barbecue. 
There will also be trophies presented for the best overall Lambretta scooter, best turned out scooter club, best vintage scooter and farthest travelled rider. The entertainment will then continue into the evening at Ride Pavilion on the seafront with everyone welcome at a bargain £10 entry with a weekend ticket. Acts so far announced include the Molotovs, the Hownets and the Mexican Mods plus many more. Full details and tickets are available at www.visualimpact.co.uk backslash events and local outlets including the Super Bowl and Bagel Wrap Coffee Shop in Ryde and Visual Impact in Newport. £2 bus fare to continue until the end of October as Government Extends Scheme from the Island Echo, read by Joyce. Bus passengers on the Isle of Wight will continue to be able to travel on a single journey across the island for £2 or less until 31st October 2023, it has been announced. Southern Vectors is signed up to the Department for Transport, DFT, initiative, which restricts the cost of a single ticket at the beginning of the year. An essential part of the government's help for household scheme, the fare cap was originally set to end on 31st March, but has now been extended for the second time. The extension means that Isle of Wight bus users will be able to travel on any single journey on any of the operator's buses, except the breezes and school routes, for £2 or less. They can also use any payment method, including tap-on, tap-off, contactless, the app, and cash. Andrew Wickham, Managing Director of Southern Vectis, says, I am delighted to confirm that Southern Vectors will continue to offer the £2 fare cap in line with the government's announcement that the initiative will be extended. It will allow us to continue offering low-cost bus fares and it will help to protect many routes relied upon by local people. The aim in the long term is to encourage more people to shift their travel habits from using their cars to taking more sustainable methods of transport. One double-decker bus has the potential to take up to 75 cars off our roads and that can have a significant effect on the quality of air we breathe here on the Isle of Wight. This article is from the Isle of Wight Radio and is read by Howard. It concerns the free community event ticket to ride returns to ride seafront for the late May bank holiday weekend. The much anticipated community event will return to Eastern Gardens on Ride Beach, taking place on Saturday and Sunday 27th, 28th of May. This feel-good extravaganza promises a weekend of live music, local traders, food stalls, kids' art and crafts, and much more. The event aims to bring together the community while supporting the MS Society Isle of Wight. Event goers can look forward to an impressive lineup of live music acts, including Scooted and Booted Sound System with their Saturday Soul playlist, featuring Northern Soul and 70s Soul, followed by Scar on the Sand on Sunday. Also performing are the Red Cats Rock and Roll Trio, White Hot Pipes, Funk Soup, Charlene Duncan, Queenie the Soul Queen, Greg Barnes Music, Beth and John, Amy Jolliffe, Corrine Atkins Music, among others. With such diverse talent on display, there'll be something to suit everyone's taste. Local island traders will be showcasing their products and services, offering a unique opportunity to discover and support the local economy. Food stalls will cater to all tastes, serving up delicious treats and refreshing beverages throughout the weekend. Additionally, kids' arts and crafts activities will provide young attendees with an entertaining and creative outlet. On-stage proceedings start late morning, with the event running until 8pm each evening. Trade stalls open from 10am each morning. 
Ticket to Ride aims to create a welcoming and inclusive atmosphere for all attendees, ensuring that everyone can enjoy the festivities. As a community-driven event, it also makes a positive impact by raising funds for the MS Society Isle of Wight. By attending this event, participants will not only have a fantastic time, but also contribute to supporting island individuals and families affected by multiple cirrhosis. The late May bank holiday weekend will be an opportunity for locals and visitors alike to come together, celebrate and enjoy the vibrant spirit of ride. Admission to Ticket to Ride is free thanks to the generous support of organisers Jack Up Events working in conjunction with Ride Town Council. For more information about the event and the schedule of performances, see https forward slash jackupevents.co.uk what's on or follow Ticket to Ride on social media. Now in its ninth year, Ticket to Ride is a community event held over each of the spring and summer bank holiday weekends. It aims to bring together residents and visitors through live music, local vendors and various activities while also supporting charitable causes. The event strives to foster a sense of unity, joy and celebration within the community. Before we start the second part of the talking news, here is this week's society news. Swimming on Monday between 1.15 and 2.15 at Medina Leisure Centre Newport. If you would like to come along for a swim or just relaxation in the water, we have the use of the whole pool and we are always looking for new members to join the group. Every Monday, 9.30 to 12.30, we have drop-in sessions where members can come into Millbrook House to learn about accessibility features on computers, laptops, tablets and phones. Sam, our Accessibility Officer, will be on hand to help with any questions. Yoga is on Tuesday at Millbrook between 1.45 and 2.45pm. Refreshments will be served afterwards. Please note this is a new time. Coffee and chat will be on Wednesday between 10am and 11.30am here at Millbrook House. Please come along and chat with members, friends and staff. Wednesday afternoon we have our Eye on Social group at Millbrook House between 2 and 3.30pm. This month we welcome Sally Ash from the Isle of Wight Council speaking about scams. Sally has been along to our Mix and Mingle group in the past and her talk is very interesting and well worth a listen to. We all think that we will never be victims of scams, but Sally explains how easy it is for anyone to fall for anyone to fall for them. So please come along and learn about them and enjoy tea and cake as well for three pounds. Our usual mix and mingle is on Thursday between 10.30am and 2pm. Our striders will be meeting at Millbrook House on Friday for a stride around Carisbrook, Gapcombe and the surrounding area, followed by lunch at the Eight Bells Carisbrook. The group is open to everyone who is fit and able to walk around five miles. For any information of the activities or events mentioned, please do not hesitate to call the office on 522205. We move on to the second part of the talking news, read by Madeleine and, and Morris. TV Comic launches accessibility aids. TV and stand up comedian Chris McCausland, who is blind, took time out from his theatre show to present a specially produced scan and listen to our QR codes to enable greater accessibility to Shanklin Theatre and Eastern Gardens in Sandown. Chris's show had the audience laughing from start to finish and he promised to return to Shanklin next year. Coronation champion and Sight for White trustee Ruth Hollingshead helped provide the audio descriptions for the accessibility aids and has helped provide similar amenities across the island. 
A predatory police officer who pursued a relationship with a vulnerable model he met while on duty on the Isle of Wight would be sacked from the force had he not already quit, a tribunal heard. Dominic Green, who left his role as a PC on May the 13th, was found guilty of committing gross misconduct following a tribunal at Aldershot Police Station. He had previously denied any wrongdoing. Green was also found to have committed a second act of gross misconduct by attempting to dissuade the woman, known as Miss A, from participating in the investigation against him. The tribunal heard how, on March 19, 2019, Green met the young, physically attractive woman when he stopped the untaxed car she was driving. Green was working in the armed response vehicle on the island at the time. He then used her details to get in touch with her using his personal phone and met up with her months later. A Hampshire police spokesman said the panel found that Green would have been dismissed from the force had he not already resigned. Barnabas Branston, representing Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary, said the officer's conduct has significantly crossed the line of acceptable behaviour into the realms of gross misconduct. Mr Branson said Green should have known Miss A was classed as vulnerable because she suffered from depression. At a private hearing, Mr Branston said over a period of several months he engaged in inappropriate and flirty correspondence, including asking her for a bath selfie and referring to how attractive she looked in her modelling shots in swimwear and underwear. Mr Branston said there must have been a degree of predatory steps with the malign intent of sexual gratification. Miss A said she agreed on a night in June or July that year to meet Green in his hatchback car outside her home at about 2am when they began kissing and he performed a sex act on her. Miss A said she was happy to meet with Mr Green but called his claim that he had visited her to discuss her car and that no intimate contact occurred absurd. Plan for hearing aid users. In future, elderly people with hearing problems will be referred to spec savers or the hospital, replacing care delivered by a vital charity service and instead of being seen at volunteer-run clinics. As the County Press reported last week, the RNID, that's the Royal National Institute for Deaf People, which helps those with NHS-supplied hearing aids, will close on the Isle of Wight at the end of the month. It has supported scores of islanders over 30 years. This week it emerged its closure was to avoid duplication with other providers. The Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board has pulled its annual grant, meaning the the RNID was left with no choice but to end its provision. The announcement led to fears about waiting times for repairs to hearing aids. The ICB told the County Press, although it recognises the excellent service provided by the RNID, support is already provided by two major contracts. Natasha Taplin, Acting Place Director for the ICB, said, Both of these services are delivered on the island and provide assessment, fitting, provision and maintenance of hearing aids for patients. It is our responsibility as Commissioners of Health and Care Services to make sure we use the resources available to us efficiently and effectively and to avoid duplication. In recognition of this, we have made the difficult decision not to renew the grant funding for this service. The ICB thanked the team at the RNID for their hard work and dedication. It added, We will be working with them to ensure we communicate clearly to patients how they can continue to access support should they require it. Last year, the Community Hearing Aid Maintenance and Support Service, which has a dedicated team of six volunteers, maintained 2,288 hearing aids. In future, the ICB says, patients who are non-complex, that's generally those 55 plus with age-related hearing loss, 
can be referred to Specsavers on 01983 821 280. Patients with more complex needs can be referred to Acute Audiology Stroke ENT at St Mary's on 01983 552-205. A ceremony at St Mary's Hospital marked National Nurses Day on Friday, May the 12th. It was an opportunity to congratulate some of the Isle of Wight Hospital's most dedicated staff members and present them with awards. It's about recognising the difference nurses make every day, not just in this hospital but all over the world, said Juliet Pierce who has been a nurse for more than 30 years. It's a real opportunity for us to share what makes it special to be a nurse. Among those recognised for their outstanding work were Ed Mark Villa, Jackie Heseldine, Michelle Cook, Ron Endaya, Julie Whitewood, Joanna Dunkling, Charlotte Bexon Stone, Cicely Jones and Sean Firminger. Our nurses and midwives go above and beyond every day and this was a real opportunity for us to stop and say thank you and celebrate them, Juliet said. Post-pandemic work is still very challenging. A lot of people during the pandemic became much more unwell and we've seen the number of cancer diagnoses go up. We are getting there and we are doing lots of innovative things to meet the care needs of people on the island. Sean Firminger told the County Press, even though this is an individual award, it has only been possible because of the nursing team I'm lucky to call myself a part of. My colleagues all empower and support me and give me a platform to allow me to be the nurse I want to be. This award is as much theirs as it is mine. Juliet Pierce said, we're always looking for more nurses and to grow the workforce. We've been successful this year, particularly with our international recruitment and our Grow Our Own. If you're interested in looking after people and you love working in teams and want to make a difference, this is a great career for you. I've been a nurse for a very long time and it has been the most wonderful career. I would never have chosen to do anything different. Trig and Co Estate Agents based in Newport sponsored the awards. Inspectors heap praise on school. Students who board at a specialist school on the island get warm and nurturing care and support from dedicated staff, a government inspector has found. St Catharines in Ventnor, which educates students with speech, language and communication needs, has been rated outstanding for its residential provision by Ofsted. In a recently published report, inspectors said the residential specialist school provides highly effective services that consistently exceed the standards of good. They also say the school's actions contribute significantly improved outcomes and positive experiences for children and young people. The school was inspected in March and has 92 students 21 of which use the residential provision. Overall, inspectors said residential students flourish and love staying at the school. One told inspectors they would be heartbroken if they could not come to the school and parents were equally enthusiastic about St Catharines, saying the care team always go the extra mile. Inspectors saw students learning to care for themselves and others developing their independence and social skills, as well as encouraging their housemates when they had done something well. The health needs of students are particularly well managed at the school nurses, by the school nurses who provide an invaluable service, the inspectors said. Students feel safe across the school and in the residential houses with meticulous behaviour support plans in place, to understand their needs and ensure they are comprehensively met. Leaders have an exceptional knowledge of all the students in the school and promote a culture of high aspiration. The school's safeguarding is exemplary, the inspectors said, and vigorous measures are used when serious incidents are reported. 
the residential provision continues to improve and develop, Ofsted found. Sarah Thompson, the principal at St Catharines, said she was extremely proud of the dedication of the staff and students. She said, the integrated working of all departments supports the students to flourish and achieve and it is wonderful inspectors were able to see it during the, their visit. Students at Christ the King College experienced the BAE STEM Roadshow from the depths of the ocean to outer space last week. Supported by British Aerospace in conjunction with the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy, the three-person team presenting from BAE, Kat, Mike and Saffron, inspired students in years seven and eight. Last week, the team also visited Carisbrook and Medina Colleges, the Bay, Ride Academy, the Island Free School and Honey Hill Primary. The 50-minute show was built around the journey from the bottom of the marina trench to the outer limits of our solar system and beyond. Claire Rennie, STEM coordinator at Christ the King College, said, It was wonderful that so many Isle of Wight children and young people are enjoying these STEM opportunities. It opens up so many avenues for them. Who knows where it will lead for each of them in the future? One premise of the performance was to consider the engineering challenges and solutions to explore hostile environments like under the ocean or in deep space and how to put humans in these places. Students learned about the scale of the oceans and examined some fascinating facts, for example, just how much water is there on Earth. In space, students explored how vast it is and looked at some of the engineering challenges around space travel. The interactive show allowed students to put their communication skills to the test and other interactive exercises challenged them to see just how much they know about our solar system. The finale of the show featured a huge sun which demonstrated how large it is compared to the Earth, leaving students astounded. Andrew Montrose, head teacher at Christ the King College, said, I don't want our students to miss out on what other students get across the county. And although they missed a lesson, the upside is that they learned about the world and it captured their imagination. It gives students an idea of the future that they would not have had. I'm very grateful for Claire and the other staff who have helped to organise the event. Road Crash Blame Game Mainland motorists, irresponsible young drivers and incapable old drivers are not the main cause of crashes on island roads, a senior police chief has said. It follows 2021 data published by the Isle of Wight's Community Safety Partnership, which showed there were 242 road accidents involving injury on the island. Speaking at the Isle of Wight Council's Corporate Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday, Councillor Chris Quirk said the impression on the island is that there is a Twin Peak issue with young drivers being irresponsible and old drivers not being capable. He also questioned whether it was possible to know if it was islanders or holidaymakers who caused the accidents. Councillor Quirk hoped through knowing who caused the accidents, actions could be targeted to those groups to try to reduce incidents. Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary's Superintendent Robert Mitchell said there was nothing to indicate an issue with mainland drivers coming across, as crashes were mainly resident drivers. He also said there was no differential between young and old drivers, although there may be more of an influence of drug driving on the younger population. Superintendent Mitchell said there is a challenge with the layout of roads on the island and the rural nature, and a certain complacency with some residents on, on how safe it is to speed. Analysis of the accidental data suggested more incidents occurred between April and September than, than in any other months, and between Wednesday to Saturday than other days. The majority of crashes, the CSP said, occurred on built-up roads with a speed limit of 21 to 30 miles an hour, and not usually at junctions. 
A concern for the CSP was the relatively high rates of admission to hospital for motorcyclists age up to 24, which was above the national average. To crack down on road safety, which is a priority for the CSP, the Roads Policing Unit has recently been re-established with officers undertaking speed enforcement activity. Superintendent Mitchell said that in a recent campaign, Operation Mile, more than 120 offences had been picked up and drivers were prosecuted either through a ticker or in court, with the vast majority for impaired driving through drugs or alcohol. Inspiring Isle of Wight entrepreneurs were quizzed on their latest ventures by island business professionals. Seven student teams from a mix of island schools and colleges have been competing since last September to win the overall title of Best Company as part of the Young Enterprise Company programme. Over the course of the academic year, each student team, supported and guided by a business advisor, has devised and launched a business. The teams took on challenges like in Dragon's Den to win real cash investor funding from a panel of island business leaders. They also took on retail training opportunities and a grand final at Key Arts in Newport was the last hurdle for the teams to get over. As well as delivering a trade stand, teams formally presented their business report to a packed out Mingela Theatre. Awards were made for teams that delivered best on presentation, sustainability, marketing and teamwork. Wisteria from Ride Academy picked up the top honour as best company along with the marketing, marketing award. SeaCycle from Christ the King College were recognised with the best presentation award and Clouds of Ventnor from St Catherine's College won the Team Journey Award. Truly Retro, representing the Isle of Wight College, came up with the strongest approach to sustainability. The top four island teams will now go on to the Hampshire and Isle of Wight final in Southampton later this year. Ambulance service therapy dogs for when going gets rough. Staff at the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service have welcomed 12 new four-legged colleagues to their team to help reduce stress in the workplace. Introducing therapy dogs was the idea of specialist paramedic Sophie Brockman, who sought to help those who have had a, a rough day. Sophie said, due to the nature of our work, our ambulance staff are regularly exposed to distressing situations. Our new four-legged colleagues will support teams by visiting the ambulance station and spending time with the teams when they can during breaks and downtime. The first recruit of the new intake was Ted, an eight-year-old Labrador. Owner and paramedic Emma Webb said, being able to reduce stress in the workplace and support our colleagues who are often working in challenging circumstances is incredibly important. Evidence shows that interacting with dogs can de decrease levels of cortisol and systolic blood pressure, which are ind indicators of heightened stress. Director of Operations for the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service, Victoria White, has also volunteered her own dog, Freddy, for the scheme. She said, I have personally seen firsthand what a positive difference dogs can make in the care home my dad is in. A man has been arrested and a large quantity of cannabis and cash seized following a drugs raid. Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary carried out a warrant at an address on Newport Road in Lake last week. Police were able to gain entry to the property using an enforcer. A 30-year-old was arrested on suspicion of being concerned in the supply of Class B drugs. Posting on Facebook, Isle of Wight Police said, We have been relentlessly pursuing criminals to ensure that their lives, not those of local people, are a misery. Criminals need to know that the Isle of Wight is a hostile environment for them and that every effort will be made to seek justice for victims. One of our priorities locally is tackling drug supply and the associated harm it causes. Drug supply can be linked to serious violence and knife crime as well as the exploitation of children. 
Officers are urging anyone concerned about drug dealing in their neighbourhood to report it to the police on 101. Things are going right if there's a Waitrose. People told me to go to East Clouds, so I went there and it's perfectly fine. They've even got a Waitrose. The creator of hit YouTube series Turd Towns has revealed the places on the Isle of Wight he visited which did not make the final cut. In an exclusive interview with the County Press, the man behind the viral video said he was expecting World War III before he arrived, but instead found the island as a whole to be really nice. He visited after subscribers to his channel voted the island as the place he should review next in a poll. The video, which has so many far amassed which so far has amassed 177,000 views, labelled Sandown embarrassing, Roxall a weeping wart, and suggested Newport should be knocked down. The Turd Towns creator, who asked to be referred to as Towns to protect his identity, said he was surprised that most islanders agreed with him. The other towns to feature on the list are Ventnor, Ryde and Shanklin. But the cameras visited plenty of other towns which, thankfully, did not. He said, one local said braiding. It's a little bit scruffy, but you can't throw it under the bus because it has one derelict building. It's not a reflection of the entire village. People also told me to go to East Cows. So I went there and it's perfectly fine. I don't know what people are talking about. You know, things are going all right if there's a Waitrose. I saw there were reports of antisocial behaviour in Freshwater, but it's a really nice place. Towns 30 said his interest in neglected and obscure places first peaked as a child when he when he read Crap Town's books in the car on UK family holidays. Now a full-time YouTuber, he said his videos aren't designed to offend. He said, I want to bring back humour into the world. We used to be able to laugh at ourselves. I hope that by shedding a light on places which are really bad, it can help improve them. So would he come back to the island? He would love to, he said but first he wants to see some investment. A serial sex offender from the Isle of Wight has been jailed after going off the police radar for almost two weeks. Gary Taylor, a registered sex offender with a history of sexual assaults on vulnerable lone females, was required to tell police about his movements. The 62-year-old left his home on the Isle of Wight without informing the authorities on February the 11th this year and did not turn up again until February the 22nd when he presented himself at Torquay Police Station but refused to complete the necessary forms. He was eventually arrested in Totnes the next day and court heard he had been living rough in Devon. He claimed he wanted to be arrested so he could get treated for a hip condition. Taylor was categorised as a dangerous offender when he was jailed for a total of eight years and four months in 2015 for sexually assaulting an 18-year-old woman who had mental health issues. He approached her while she was sitting on a bench in June 2014 and offered her a cigarette and whiskey before taking her to a bridge at Summer Lock Approach where he was sleeping rough. He went on to sexually assault her, leaving her traumatised. He also has convictions for sexually assaulting lone females on trains and was already the, on the register when he committed the offence in Salisbury. Taylor, formerly of Salisbury and the Isle of Wight but now of no fixed address, admitted failing to comply with the sex offenders register and was jailed for nine months by Judge David Evans at Exeter Crown Court. Taylor was not represented but told the judge he had been confused by the law. He said he went to the police station in the hope of being arrested, but had been turned away. He said, I went to get arrested because I needed treatment for a broken hip, but it was not until the next day that I got picked up for something else. Review of leisure centres continues. The future of council-owned leisure centres on the island is still being reviewed six months on. 
The Isle of Wight Council has struggled to recover membership levels at its three leisure centres, Westridge, The Heights and Medina, following the COVID pandemic. The service review has been ongoing since November and is looking at current income and expenditure levels. Councillor Julie Jones-Evans, the Cabinet Member for Business Development, said they are still gathering data to understand how much money the authority is saving in energy costs after the recent installation of carbon reduction measures at Medina and the Heights. The, re the review is now likely to finish in the autumn, Councillor Jones Evans said, ready for the Council's budget setting decisions for next year. The authority has said it recognises the importance of the services to islanders and visitors, but is carrying out the review in light of the large increases in fuel costs and the overall impact of the cost of living crisis. It had been intended the review would be finished by the end of last year, so it could help the Council review financial decisions in the budget. The outcome of the review will depend on the findings, a Council spokesperson said, and would primarily be used in the Council. If any significant decisions need to be made, then the relevant information would be made public. There were fears the leisure centres would have to close due to the increasing running costs to pay for some of the island's social, social care needs, but they were quashed. In the last financial year, the authority was facing a hole in its leisure and sports development budget of more than £1.2 million. Despite the, the leisure gym and fitness facilities being fully open and recent upgrades undertaken to equipment, one card membership levels had been slow to recover. Councillor Jones Evans told the scrutiny committee membership levels are up 17% compared to 2019. Prices at one leisure went up in April in line with inflation, the council said. There has been mixed feedback over proposed traffic restrictions and speed limits for the forthcoming new football ground. Changes to highway orders are set to be approved for busy roads in Whippingham around where the new stadium will be built. The Isle of Wight Council received 19 representations over the proposed speed changes, 10 in support but 9 against. The decision was delayed until May the 18th as certain documents were not available for consideration. They are part of the plans for the proposed new home of Newport Football Club and would reduce motorist speed to 40 miles an hour near the site's proposed entrance and exit. Currently, the stretches of Whippingham Road and Racecourse leading up to the roundabout are 50 miles per hour. Other proposals would ensure safe entrance and exit to the football ground. If going into the site, you would only be able to turn left coming from the roundabout. Leaving the football ground, you would only be able to turn left, sending all traffic to the racecourse roundabout. Concerns were raised in a public consultation about ensuring people would follow the restrictions. Many comments suggested traffic should instead use East Cows Road to get to the site, like Isle of Wight Festival camping traffic, which would remove traffic from the roundabout, improve traffic flow and reduce risk. Another said potential traffic lights should be installed at the top of the hill by the bus stops. They said it would be ludicrous not to have one as many people would be crossing the road to reach the bus stop heading back to Newport. One resident said lowering the speed limit would not stop accidents and having the entrance there would, if anything, cause more accidents. In support, one said the changes may cause some disruption, but the long-term gain far outweighs the problems. Another said it would increase public safety and any drop in speed limit was good. Donkeys after a muddy award. The Isle of Wight Donkey Sanctuary is asking islanders to vote to get them through to the national finals of the Muddy Stilettos Awards. Muddy Stilettos is a lifestyle website started in 2011 by Hero Brown a journalist who moved from London to the Buckinghamshire countryside and didn't know her way around. 
She started the website to give other city-dwelling women tips on things to do, see and experience when they venture out of the city. Two island attractions have made it through to the top five in the regional finals in the best family attractions category and the popular Roxel based home for abused and unwanted donkeys is now all hands on deck to get enough votes to get them through to the finals. Although their donkeys are usually pictured all pristine and clean, they quite like the idea of winning a muddy award. The popular Tapnell Park Farm is also in the final in the same category. Voting is open until midnight on June the 4th and everybody entering can also enter a prize draw to win a £1,200 deluxe break in the Lake District, so it may not be just the donkeys that benefit. If you'd like to help one of these two island attractions to get through to the final stage of the awards, go online to iow.life slash msvote. Other island businesses that have made the regional award finals are Seaview Art Gallery and Cows Gallery, Compass Bar, Medina Books, The Terrace and Pink Mead Estate and Vineyard, Dimbola Tea Room, Summer Lily, Smoking Lobster Restaurant, Duxmoor Botanics and Blue by the Sea. Another Conservative has joined the race to become the island's second MP. Joe Robertson is currently leader of the Conservative group at the Isle of Wight Council and he wants to represent East Wight at the next general election. The island is expected to be split into two areas as part of a national plan to make constituencies more even. A final decision is due at Westminster before July the 1st. In 2019, Councillor Robertson stood for Erith and Thamesmead in South London, helping his party gain four percentage points to finish second to Labour's Abina Aponga Azair. 19,882 votes to 16,124 votes. Councillor Robertson said, It is a huge honour to represent residents and campaign about the things that matter more to islanders, like affordable housing local NHS funding and regeneration of our towns. It would be an even greater honour to have the opportunity to champion the East White in Parliament and build on the work I have already started at the Council. Councillor Robertson is an in-house advisor to a dementia charity. He previously worked as a family and children's lawyer. He has served as a governor on two island primary schools as a trustee of Citizens Advice and as president of the island branch of the Campaign to Protect Rural England. Among those backing his campaign are former Isle of Wight Council Cabinet Member for Business and Regeneration Wayne Whittle and Chris Quirk, Mayor of Shanklin. In December, fellow Conservative Harriet Hadfield, a former journalist, announced her plans to try to win the candidacy. Mr Whittle said Joe is a local boy. He grew up on the island and knows what makes the East White tick because he is one of us. He would be a serious and hard-working MP in Parliament, speaking up for residents and local businesses. The next election will be the toughest in a generation and without Joe standing the Conservatives may struggle to win. Councillor Robertson says he has the backing of former Government Minister Lord Brabazon of Tara and dementia campaigner Lady Grills. Meanwhile, Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley intends to stand for the Conservative Party in the West White constituency. Refurbished lifeboat station is reopened. Yarmouth RNLI's lifeboat station has been reopened by Dame Ellen MacArthur following an extensive refurbishment. Improvements have been made to the building's crew crew facilities, the volunteer-run RNLI shop and the mechanics workshop, which now sits next to the all-weather lifeboat in the harbour. Dame Ellen, who is Yarmouth Station's chairwoman and has a house in Cowes, was there to open the new facilities on Thursday, May 11th. She said, we know and appreciate lifeboats do great work 
and for me this station has a spe specific connection because I used to live in Yarmouth for a while back in 1998. That's where I met Howard Having, being his friend for 25 years and have been follower of his journey as a coxswain for 23 years, I feel part of the station. I really feel honoured and privileged to be invited to open the new facilities. The opening ceremony was attended by supporters, crew and some of those who have been rescued by the station's volunteers. Those who joined the celebrations included Yarmouth's current volunteer crew, local business owners and Yarmouth's newly appointed mayor, among others. Sandown has a blue flag beach for 2023, environmental charity Keep Britain Tidy announced this week. The 2023 Seaside Awards were also unveiled with Sandown, Seagrove and Springvale, which is a non-bathing beach, all receiving one. Sandown is one of only seven places in the region to fly both awards. Former Sandown, Sandown Mayor Paddy Lightfoot said, The blue flag reflects the investment Sandown has made to provide beach lifeguards, boys in the bay, a new public toilet at Eastern Gardens and in working with Sandown and Shanklin Lifeboat. Founder of popular classic car show dies. Tributes have been paid to the founder and organiser of the Isle of Wight classic car extravaganza, Philip Gallucci, who died suddenly on Sunday, aged 81. The event is being held on Ride Esplanade in September. But posting on Facebook, members said, it is with great sadness the team at the Isle of Wight Classic Car Extravaganza have to announce the death of its creator and organiser, Victor Gallucci. Obviously, this has come as a terrible shock to us all, but we are hopeful, with the backing of Ride Town Council and our sponsors, the show will go on as planned in Vic's memory. Ride Town Council added, Vic was not only a kind-hearted individual, but also had the sharpest sense of humour, leaving a lasting impression on everyone he met. His infectious smile could brighten even the gloomiest of days. In honour of Vic's memory and his passion for classic cars, we will be working tirelessly alongside Isle of Wight Classic Car Extravaganza to ensure the classic car show continues as planned. This event will be a tribute to Vic and the immense joy he brought. We extend our deepest sympathy and condolences to Victor Gallucci's family and friends during this difficult time. Vic was also an actor and played DC Tom Baker in the long-running TV show The Bill. And now we move on to White Memories and Nostalgia. Here is a headline that reads, Look Out and Look Up. There are dragons to be spotted on the Isle of Wight. There are dragons on the Isle of Wight. Look up to the ridges or just a few houses and you will be able to see them. These decorative terminals at the end of the ridge tiles mainly date from Edwardian times or just after. They are made of terracotta, which is made of finely ground up previously baked clay. This gives it a good red colour and is excellent for moulding. One of the chief sculptors of the terracotta on the island from 1900 was Harry Pritchett. In the Pritchett, Gumville and Hillis Works catalogue of 1905, you could buy a dragon terminal for 40 shillings. An ordinary but decorated end of ridge tile cost just 7 shillings, so that is why the dragons are rare. Ridge tiles could be sold with crests, decoration of various sorts, these cost between 4 pence and 8 pence per foot. The dragon depicted as his tail hanging through one of these crests. Harry was not only creating finials, he also created various moulded tiles. The most well known of these is the Carisbrook donkey. This today can be seen on the Marks and Spencer building facing Church Lytton Park. The donkey in the wheel at Carisbrook was the trademark of the soft drinks manufacturers Gould & Co. Gould & Co had their works at Charter House near the church of St Thomas in the centre of Newport. The large terracotta plaque made of individual tiles was originally placed there. When the firm moved to the church Lytton in 1931, the plaque went too 
and subsequently was erected upon the replacement building M and S. The best time of day to see it just after midday when the sun slants at an angle on it, showing up the deep relief of the moulding. Several island Victorian or Edwardian houses have moulded tiles as decoration and porches sometimes had elaborate arches with terracotta work, including elaborate keystones sporting fruit or flowers. Flat tiles were sometimes used to good effect. Harry Pritchard also made enrichments detailed planters with much moulded or carved work. He also sculpted such models as the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII. Apart from the wealth of the island brick-built houses from the Victorian and Edwardian period, other reminders of our brick industry remain. Have you ever wondered why there are lakes at Gumville, Rookley or below the hospital at St Mary's? These lakes are the old clay pits from which clay was dug for making bricks. Others still exist around the island. The one by the hospital was used to dig the clay for making the House of Industry in the 1780s. The building is still in use today, though not as a workhouse. There were over a hundred brick-making sites shown around the island on maps covering the last 200 years. Sometimes the pits have been filled in, but the name may remain, such as Clay Pit Cops. There are references to Brick Kiln or Brickfield. To find out more about the island brick-making industry, visit the free display of island brick-making at Whippingham Church Hall near the church. And now in my view, Catherine James writes an article that reads, Not much of a culture shock. I'm not usually one for holidaying abroad, climate emergency guilt clipping my wings before they've even fully fledged, but last month this old bird flew to Turkey. I'd anticipated a culture shock, visiting a country with an unfamiliar language in an alphabet I could not entirely recognise, with a reputation for desiccating temperatures, destructive earthquakes and sweet sludgy coffee. But maybe the Isle of Wight has more in common with this pan-continental republic than you might think. Let's compare the two. The topog topography seemed exotic to my southern English eyes. I'm used to driving on undulating roads over lush rolling downland with beautiful coastal scenery. In northwestern Turkey, my similar similarity sinuous road trips afforded breathtaking views of the sparkling Gulf of Izmir, edged with jagged mountains. Both areas, Verdant Hills, are pockmarked with conspicuous excavations, Mordoan marble quarries gouging a pinky scar in the crag, correlating with the island's white chalk <coughs> pits. The landscapes weren't so different after all, one point each in this round. I stayed in a seaside township on the Karaburan Peninsula. A sandy shore fringes this part of the North Aegean where on plunging in the sea temperature was akin to a decent summer's day in Apley. The clear Turkish briny triumphed with its abundance of fish and a noticeably increased buoyancy, but then ride equalised with its expanse of sand and dramatic tidal conditions. There's not much of either at Mordoan. Turkey's high speed limits would give your average corkhead bimbler a nosebleed. And instead of triggering traffic police officer with a speed camera, you might get pulled over by a gendarme with an actual gun. Also, rather than a hedgehog, it's possible that you'll need to dodge a porcupine. While I didn't see any spiky mammals, I did encounter a wild tortoise, no match in a race for the island's spring hares. A jaunt to Izmir necessitated a trip on a car ferry, well within my sphere of experience. Except this one required no pre-booking, nor early arrival at the terminal. I simply paid a fixed, not surged, price at the booth before driving aboard, marshalled insouciantly into position on the deck. 
straightforward compared to cross-Solent operations. Like Sandown, Turkey has an embarrassment of ruined structures. Our resort's derelict hotels lose this round. Seasonal arson and woeful neglect are no match for historic crumbling temples and overgrown amphitheatres. The island can claw back an equaliser though. Both the ancient city of Ephesus and braiding Roman villa fell into abandonment when their harbours silted up. Back home, the clanging, the clanging peal of All Saints church bells wafted across ride into my open windows, accompanying by blackbirds warbling their evening song. This music was as magical and profoundly affecting as the call of the muezzin, amplified from elegant minarets, which I'd heard echoing around the valley of Istanbul's golden horn. I've witnessed the sunset not only over the gateway to the Isle of Wight, but also that of Europe and Asia. Top marks to both places. This is an article in Public Information with the headline that reads, Don't fall foul of computer software service fraud. A look at another type of fraud this month, computer software service fraud. Criminals may cold call you claiming there are problems with your computer and they can help you to solve them. They will often use the names of well-known companies such as Microsoft or Apple. They may even use the name of your broadband provider to sound more legitimate. So how does the scam work? The criminals will ask you to complete various actions on your device, including downloading a remote access tool. This gives them complete access to everything on your computer. A genuine computer company will never call you out of the blue regarding issues with your computer, so hang up straight away. Never allow anyone to remotely access your device. If you are having issues with the device, contact the retailer you purchased it from or a reliable local computer specialist who will be able to help you. If it's problems with your broadband, contact them directly to resolve the issue. If you do inadvertently follow a scammer's advice, as soon as you realise, close down your device, contact your bank and go to a computer specialist who can clean your device, check it for viruses and make sure that anything that has been now downloaded is removed. How to seek help and report a scam. For advice on scams, call Citizens Advice uh, Consumer Helpline on 0808 250 5050. To report a scam, call Action Fraud on 0300 123 2040. For more information on scams, you can visit www.iwasp.org. UK. And now we have some entertainment um, what's on. Mini Festival has sustainability at heart. A free mini festival is coming to the Isle of Wight later this month. The Be More Green Festival runs from 10am to 5pm on Sunday, May the 28th. Hosted at Moor Green Reservoir Park Cows, Festival goers can expect artist-led activities, entertainment, market stalls and more, all centred around the theme of the island's UNESCO biosphere status and sustainability. There will be plenty to see and do, including wildlife discovery, bug hoovering, museum of nature, kids' crafts, arts activities, live music and fresh local food. On Sunday the 28th of May, the Bank Holiday Sunday Soul Sessions are at 2pm. There is a fantastic lineup of DJs spinning decades of soulful vinyl and reggae. It's free entry and it's at the Ventnor Winter Gardens, Pier Street in Ventnor. And you can call 857757 for more details. And there's Bembridge Flower Festival in Holy Trinity Church, Bembridge. And it's called Happy and Glorious. And it takes place between 
Saturday the 27th and Monday the 29th of May from 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock but closed for a wedding on Saturday 2.30 to 4.30. The entrance is free, donations welcome and on number 8 bus route and well-behaved dogs welcome. And at Shanklin Theatre, the show Beyond the West End is on on Thursdays the 25th of May, Thursday the 15th of June and Thursday the 22nd of June. Calendar Girls, the musical, is on on Sunday the 25th and Monday the 26th of June. And back to May the 19th, June Field is World's Greatest Psychic. Saturday the 20th of May, Go Your Own Way, which is the Fleetwood Mac Legacy. Sunday the 21st is Spotlight Isle of Wight Limited presents Welcome to the Jungle. And Saturday the 27th of May is ABBA Reunion. On Friday the 2nd of June, the Diana Ross story in the name of love. Saturday the 3rd of June, the myth of serial killer profiling. And on Saturday the 10th of June, there is a Shanklin Theatre tour. Uh, Hubert Parry 175th birthday concert. And that's featuring the Isle of Wight Cantata Choir and organist Andrew Cooper. And this will take place on Thursday the 25th of May at 6.30pm in Holy Trinity Church Cows. The tickets are fifteen pounds each, and they can. Um, it's advertised on www.ticketsource.co.uk/parry-cows, or telephone three 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 six 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 four four six six. Option one. The Yarmouth Sea Songs. Festival takes place next weekend from Friday, May the 26th to Sunday, May the 29th, along with one of the largest annual gatherings of gaff rigged boats in the UK, with around 100 of the boats moored in the harbour. Following the growing popularity of the festival, the event has expanded to four days and will have a larger marquee and more acts and performers. Some acts will also be appearing at the Wheat Sheaf and other venues around Yarmouth over the weekend. The free event, which raises funds for National Coast Watch at the Needles, kicks off around noon, with performances running on to early evening. The formal opening ceremony takes place at around 4pm on Saturday. Daily performances will carry on from noon to early evening, with various stalls selling food and ice cream, an island ales bar and children's entertainment. On Monday evening, the celebration will come to a close at around 4pm with the Fantasia of Sea Songs, including renditions of such favourites as Royal Britannia, complete with flag waving and audience participation. And we now have some letters to read. Thank you, NHS. The name and address are supplied. I would just like to say what a brilliant job the A&E team did on Saturday, May the 6th, when I presented my wife with stroke symptoms. With scans, etc, etc, they stabilised her and put her on the road to recovery. They are worth every penny. Thank you, NHS. Dear Editor, with regards to the new CEO of the Islands NHS Trust and our partnership with Portsmouth, Islanders should realise that the hospital is in Cosham, not Portsmouth. Travelling there for treatment or to visit friends or relatives will involve a ferry, a train and finally a two-mile walk unless people can afford a taxi. And then the whole thing in reverse. For the ordinary person who earns just more than enough to get help or simply can't afford it, the danger is that they will say no and refuse treatment and with no treatment available locally may have to remain in a lot of pain. Why is our MP supporting this? He is on the record as welcoming the deal. Didn't he look at the implications for ordinary islanders? I've done the journey to Cosham myself twice on foot and it's not easy even when you're fit and well and many people travelling for treatment are likely to be quite long in the tooth. 
I can't understand why they didn't do a deal with Southampton instead. I am sure that the new CEO will concentrate on her duties in Portsmouth. After all, we've already handed over the £10 million for their two new wards, so thank you very much for the money. Now just give me more for my new salary. I'm sorry I just don't get it, and I believe the island is going to lose out once again. I pray I'm wrong, writes E. Ayres from Ride. Island Soapbox. Do they think we're morons? And this is from Jay Burton in Ride. Dear Editor, the doublespeak of this government is simply staggering. They must think we are all morons. In the midst of supplying countless quantities of armaments to Ukraine for its war with Russia, along with heightened signs of aggression coming from China, Conservative Defence Minister Ben Wallace is shrinking our army troop numbers to an all-time low, while saying he is shielding them from further reductions. Work that, work that one out. It's like Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley voting in Parliament against the Environmental Bill, then pretending to be all concerned about the vast quantity of untreated effluent being deliberate de deliberately discharged into our seas. The solution? Give the woke glitterati a free water butt. They'll never notice. The buck really does stop with the electorate. Bob Seeley and the Conservative Party's plethora of broken promises needs to be called out for what they really are. And no Bob, a free water butt, care of southern water, isn't going to cut it. It is time these Tory charlatans, desperately clutching on to power, are held to account. No doubt they will still be blindly supported by the usual twin sets and pearl groupies and their fox hunting, funny handshake brethren. However, the truth is, leaving aside all the years of lies and broken promises, their time is up. They all need to be kicked out on their butts by the good, decent people of this country. Keep your eyes on your pets, writes P.S. of Newport, the name and address supplied. Dear Editor, I read with concern that another pet is posted as missing. This week, a cat. Last week, a dog. I'm not sure if there is a spate of attempted animal thefts. I certainly hope there isn't. But someone tried to get into my house a week ago, and my cat is very similar to Teddy from Alveston. Luckily, despite disappearing, she came back. But it does worry me that pet napping may be happening on the island. I urge owners to be vigilant and take steps to secure their animals at night. Walk the White organisers had thought of everything, from Alistair Elliott in Gurnard. On Sunday I did Walk the White for the first time. It won't be my last time. It was a joyous and uplifting day. The organisers had thought of everything, so all the walkers had to do was, well, walk. There was no need for a map, as hundreds of signs and hundreds of smiling volunteers pointed us in the right direction. The day had so much to offer. Fresh air, exercise, being in nature, being part of something bigger than ourselves, supporting the hospice services which any of us may need one day and which makes such a difference to both patients and their families. Another way to support Mountbatten whilst having a good time is through attending one of their monthly concerts that feature diverse, diverse artists and a wide range of music genres. We need public service obligation for ferries, writes Warren White from Freshwater. It's good to see the chief executive of White Link take the time to respond to issues raised in the county press. But sadly, so many complaints are still left unanswered, such as why the Limington to Yarmouth crossing still ends at 8pm, seriously affecting anyone who works or travels to the New Forest and the South West, or attempting to connect to an evening train from London, or why the third Limington Yarmouth ferry is still rarely used, resulting in poor timetabling and lack of capacity for multi-link passes, which impacts the Fishbourne service at peak times, 
such as the evening of Friday, April the 28th, when there were no ferries from Portsmouth available for multi-link users, presumably to cash in on bigger non-pass fares. It can't be right that it was cheaper for me to stay on the mainland in a hotel and come back on Saturday. I have generally found the white link service to be good and the staff very accommodating, but post-COVID the company is clearly squeezing its assets, impacting island residents that rely on regular Solent travel for work, family or health reasons and also putting our tourism industry at risk with appalling peak ferry prices, to the extent that I've met people who have decided to go elsewhere around the UK or cross the Channel to France for less. Considering Mr Greenfield is a director of our Chamber of Commerce, I hope he can ex explain what he is doing to avoid killing off this hugely important part of the island economy. I've raised these issues with Ian Stewart, MP, Chairman of the Transport Select Committee, and our MP Bob Seeley, as I believe we need to instigate more formal political interventions, such as some level of public service obligation. It's now time for the monthly insight for White at Vectis Radio. This month, Chris Kane is joined by Paula Matthews, Technical Officer at White Sense. The presenters are Kelvin and Maggie Curry. The BBC In Touch programme follows, and there is no scaffolding news this week. Vectis Radio, FM 104.6, the heart of the island's community. But we've got our guests in, have we not, Maggie? We have. We have the lovely Chris Kane in, and he's brought a guest with him. Good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, Maggie is correct. I have brought in uh, my friend and colleague, the lovely Paula, mm. who is our technical officer for White Sense. So Ooh. Paula's going to be uh, chatting to you about what she gets up to okay. at the site for White. Good afternoon, Paula. Hello. And what is White Sense, for those who don't know? White Sense is the, the contracted sensory service. Right. But by that I mean um, Site for White took over the local authority contract to provide sensory services on behalf of the local authority in April 2022. Right. So um, that means really that we provide assessment and rehabilitation services for people with sight loss, hearing loss, and a combination of the both. Mm -hmm. Yep, and there's quite a few of those, aren't there? Mm -hmm. yep. So what sort of equipment do you provide? It varies. It depends on, on the needs. It depends on the outcome of the assessment. Um, we offer home visits. It, mm -hmm. It's so much better to see where a person is actually living and going to be using equipment, yep. and then you can make a much better judgment. Yep with them on what their needs are because they will have probably different ideas about what they need compared to what we believe they might need yes so between the two of us we you will come up with um a need and, and a, hopefully a solution of how to fulfill that need okay and what sort of equipment do you have in your store cupboard right we've got for sight loss we've got talking clocks mm -hmm. we have got daylight lamps We've got liquid level indicators. We've got Dysem, and Dysem is um, coloured non-slip mat. It comes in red, yellow, or blue. So you need to do um, an experiment, if you like, with the person um, at the home, and to find out which colour right. they can see best. Right. Because basically, what it's for is is it provides a background. So they can put a cup or a yeah. plate or something so and um, just makes things a bit more visible so on a specific the, place yeah. improves yeah. the contrast yeah. a bit so yeah, yeah it improves contrast indeed okay. uh, for hearing loss we have things like um, smoke alarm systems that come with vibrating alerts we have pager systems that come with a multiple of transistors transmitters and receivers um, we provide TV listening systems, personal listening systems, lots of things, really. Right. OK. All free. As I say, these are all free and provided for... It's all free. And this is provided for by the local authority? It is. It's funded entirely by the local authority. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So all the equipment, the assessment process, everything is funded by the local authority. Yes. Yeah. So uh, can you refer people for um, assessment for hearing dog or something like that? We, we can 
give information around hearing dogs. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Whether I've never actually done a referral for a hearing dog, but that's not to say it's not possible. Right. It's not something I've really looked into. Okay. So do, do you find people... Um, welcome this equipment or do you think that is there any resistance because they don't want to admit they've got a disability uh, on the whole most of our referrals come from the people themselves all oh, right okay so that that answers that question in yeah. a way yeah. um because they they recognize or <laughs> it can be a bone of contention um among families yes. mm-hmm. um, because you'll you'll get things like um, the TV turned up off the scale for yes. argument's sake. Yes, yes. Um, and or they're constantly saying, what, 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 what are you saying? And all, all of this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, but most of our referrals do come from the people, but occasionally um, they're from other professional organisations, right. adult yeah. social care right. uh, and places like that. We get referrals from the eye clinic as well, things like that. But yeah. Okay, that, that's excellent stuff. So, I mean, um, do you still do things like talking microwaves? I used to do those years ago. I guess they still do them. They are still available. It's not something that we can provide with our budget. No. Um, but we can give information and advice so th- around that sort of thing so and other domestic things, yeah. There are other things you can point people at to, Absolutely, to, to, yeah. uh, to help. Um, because I remember I turned one on once for the Living Daylight Center. He suddenly shouted at me. I've never, never seen that happen before. <laughs> um, and still the simple things like stick on pieces to, to fund the buttons. Yeah, yeah, we still provide those. Yeah. Is there, the bu- some people want to know, is there a criteria that you have to have met in order to have an assessment? Do you have to meet a certain criteria? Um, for hearing loss, you have to have a diagnosis. Uh-huh. Um, for sight loss usually it's because you've got some form of sight condition yeah mm-hmm. so that could be gla- glaucoma most commonly age-related macular degeneration there's two types wet and dry retinitis pigmentosa um, diabetic retinopathy um, so most people will have a sight condition right. of some sort um, okay. I, I went to see a gentleman the other day who ha- is has a sight problem due to the effects of a stroke. Yeah. So although okay. he's not got an, a sight condition as such, yeah. he's still it, it's the effects impairment. of the, it's sight yeah. impaired due to stroke. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this helps people live more independent lives in their own homes for a lot longer, hopefully. Indeed, that's what we're about really, is, mm. is just maintaining independence for as long as possible for yeah. people, if that's what they want to do. Yes. Mm. And they can have the equipment as long as they need it, can't they? Yeah. For as long as they need it, it's on a long-term loan basis, there is absolutely no length of time associated with that. Good. If they yeah. find that they don't want it and it's under five years old, we will take it back. Right. Okay, that's good stuff. How okay. do people find out more about that? Um, you can call us. Um, we do have a Facebook page. Um, so you can just look up White Sense, um, search on Facebook for White Sense. Mm-hmm. It will come up. Equally, if you search Site for White, you'll find us mentioned somewhere on, on the Site for White okay. Facebook page as well. Um, there's a website. Um, so if you if you go to the Site for White website, you will find us there. Um, there is a website for White Sense just on its own. Or, or you can call us on 01983 240 or email info at whitesense.org.uk. Info Brilliant. at whitesense.org.uk, uh, 240 which yes. is not far different from our studio number. No. So there we are. Okay, and Chris, uh, you have something to, uh, to add? No, Chris, you got you got to, wanted to add something at the end there, didn't you? Yes, if I could just add before before we go off. Yeah. Um, um, we are doing a, a, an event, Cycle Your Bike, <laughs> and it's Cycle Your Bike for Sight for White. OK. Cycle Your so Bike. So this is between the 17th and 24th of June. Right. Um, we're trying to clock up 932 miles. Wow. One mile for every person on the island living and affected by profound sight loss. Oh, oh okay. well, it's, it's a very specific number. It's yeah. very specific, yeah. It's a lot but of people, isn't it? It is. The journey will start on the 17th of June in Asda. So we'll have one of those stationary bikes. Oh, so right. So if anyone yeah. wants to come and join in and do their little bit for us, they're welcome to come in. Okay. The remaining days, it will be at Millbrook House. Yes. So you can come in there. And okay. Do your, pedal power 
alternatively if you you're not able to get in and do that if for whatever reason you may normally drive to work if for that day or a couple of days you want to cycle to work and if you really want to you could donate the money you would have used in petrol to us at site for white that's a good idea that's a good idea yeah. so like that's that. yeah so that's all happening the 17th to the 24th of june okay Ooh, it's not start. far away is it not far no, away not far away at all and if you're listening on the mainland there is only one asda on the other way we haven't got to tell you where it is no, the asda <laughs> yes. yes the asda yeah. <laughs> it's so not far that's from, that's from the idea. motorway is it not far from the motorway no we know where that no. is <laughs> <laughs> So, well, thank you for that, Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for coming in. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, you know you continue for a long time to help people with sight and hearing impairments. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Your support matters. We operate thanks to the support of local businesses. If you would like to advertise on Vectis Radio FM one hundred four point six, contact our team today. Marketing at vectisradio.fm. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Good evening. Fashion to me is indissociable from larger cultural and political trends. But British Vogue was increasingly distant from the culture it claimed to represent. I wanted the magazine to redefine the notion of society so that it was no longer a byword for the upper crust, but simply a reference to British society at large. We would not be exclusive and proscriptive, but inclusive on every page. Edward Aninful, editor-in-chief of British Vogue. He was born in Ghana and is describing there his own thoughts on being offered that job in 2017. A magazine thought of then, again in Edward's own words, as a white woman's magazine. But this month's issue, called Reframing Fashion, shows just how much he's extended that idea of inclusivity, full as it is of text about and photographs of people with a whole range of disabilities. And now it's available for the first time in Braille and audio formats. Well, we'll hear more from Edward Enimful later, but first we're concentrating on two visually impaired women, Jessica Enaba, who is the first blind black woman to become a barrister and was featured in the magazine, not to mention on this programme a few months ago, and artist Kimberly Burroughs, keen fashionista and now potential consumer. Just by way of introduction, can I get you both to explain your connection to this edition of British Folk? Uh, Jessica first. They approached you, I think. Yes, so I was approached by the talent casting manager who told me back in November of last year that they have a project and they would love for me to be a part of it. I was obviously interested straight away. I thought British Vogue, oh wow, how could I assist in a project on British Vogue? It was a very, very thrilling experience. But can I ask you, had you ever read Vogue? I hadn't, and the only reason I hadn't is because it was never really accessible. Right, OK, well, we'll come back to that and, indeed, what the modelling process was like for you. But, Kimberly, how about you? Because I think you describe yourself as a fashionista. I think you're very keen on fashion, but, again, presumably Vogue magazine, not all that accessible to you either. No, absolutely not. This is the first copy of British Vogue that I have read, as it's the first edition available in Braille. It interested me not only because of the accessible format, but because of the content and the powerful stories within. I first came across it on Instagram, and I listened to these really wonderful and uplifting stories and I was like oh my goodness how can I get a copy of this magazine and I ordered it to hold it in my hands and have this tangible object and and to be able to read it is such a powerful feeling. Right well I've said you're an artist so we're going to come on to that in a moment. Just before we do that let's just uh, pause for a moment to hear a bit more from the man whose vision this is. I have invisible disability you know I have eye issues and hearing issues and as well as blood disorders. It's, it's also quite personal. In the past, we have sort of used disabled models and I always believe that it can never be a one-time thing. It can never be like, OK, we've done this, the disability issue, we're done. It's a continuous conversation, like anything in life. And the more you repeat things, sort of the more people become aware. So with all the learnings that we have learned 
sort of with these issues, whether it's access to studios, whether it's access to events, whether it's access to, to photo shoots, we're going to take that and move it on with every issue. And as technology develops as well, we'll be able to sort of help more sort of disabled people because, you know, being disabled is not one thing. There's so many different disabilities. So, yeah, but it's we're learning. I'm not saying we're perfect in any way, but we're learning. The team is learning. And for me, British Vogue really, when you come into the pages of the magazine, you have to feel you have to feel welcomed. And I always believe that if you can see it, you can be it. So for me, it's very paramount to show that the fashion industry can be inclusive. Editor-in-chief of British Vogue, Edward Enninful, speaking on the Today programme. So, Kimberly, you've said you're interested in fashion. Since losing your sight, because you lost a lot of that sight in 2018, what have you been missing? Yeah, um, I've definitely missed out on trends and I don't really know what is trendy anymore so I tend to just stick with what I know in terms of makeup and with clothes and uh, and brands yeah. I try not to traverse too far into the unknown the main takeaway from the magazine is that uh, this is such a significant step forward in the fight for inclusivity and equality in the fashion industry. It sends such a powerful message that everyone deserves to be seen and celebrated for who they are. And it's a call to action for the fashion industry to do better and to uplift and celebrate and represent all individuals with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Can I ask you how you read it? So I accessed the Braille version. Well, as we've mentioned, it is also available in audio format. And for those who may prefer that, here's what it sounds like. Cover information. Coronation special by Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Munro Bergdorf, Joan Collins. Summer romance. Gorgeous looks from siren gowns to sizzling prints. Sinead Burke. Reframing fashion. Dynamic, daring and disabled. From top. Gold ring with black design on outside of ring. Large oval, also black with a cross like a compass. £2,375. Well, you can read it, but probably can't afford it, can you? Especially that ring. (laughs) 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 Jessica, just tell me a bit about the experience of actually being addressed, as it were, because you you are a model, and I think that was a completely new experience for you. So what was that like? Oh, it was an awesome experience. I had a Fran and Temi on my makeup. They were amazing. And I had Anna on my hair and she was wonderful. I had a few other people. There was too many names for me to remember, but everyone was so welcoming and everyone was describing everything that they were doing. So my makeup artists were explaining the type of products they were using. They were explaining the brush they were using to apply it. So from that experience, I took away a lot of makeup skills that I've since been able to use and develop for myself. The clothes themselves, I was able to try on a few different clothes and the uh, the colours of the dresses were described to me and, and the shoes and the jewellery, everything was described to me. And ultimately, I was able to make a decision of what dress I wanted to wear out of the dresses that I tried on, what felt most comfortable and what looked better. Well, look, we can help you relive this in terms of the one you actually chose. Jessica wears a royal blue dress with thin shoulder straps. The dress flares out at the bottom of the dress. Gold and diamond pendant necklace. Silver gold, lacquer and topaz ring. There you go. So did you think you'd chosen the wrong profession? Maybe you could go into modelling. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it's nice to be able to do both. I mean, a year ago, I had someone told me that I would appear in British Vogue with Naomi Campbell on the cover. I would have said, yeah, you're having a laugh, mate. (laughs) So it's amazing to be able to do both and to be able to reframe fashion and to meet so many inspirational people. I met Sinead Burke, who is, I think, the founder of Tilt in the Lens, and it was nice of her to to create this opportunity for us. Let me bring in Kimberly. You're probably green with envy now because you didn't get this modelling chance, but you have (laughs) got more involved, I think, in fashion through your Mm. art. Can you just explain there what opportunities has the art opened up for you? 
I have, yes. I share my work online through Instagram. And last year, a warehouse got in touch with me and were interested in a number of my paintings and wanted to put them on a limited edition range of party wear and occasion wear. And it was just such a wonderful opportunity to change the context of um, where the paintings came from originally, which I started painting in the pandemic as a form of art therapy for myself and to kind of change that and turn it into something more for celebration and for beautiful women to you know to wear this and and celebrate really wonderful occasions in their lives I I absolutely jumped at the chance to do that. Can I just get you to explain that a bit more because Mm. as I said we've established that you lost a lot of your sight in 2018 are you painting from memory? So I choose colours from random usually what's closest to me or I use an app on my phone sometimes if I want something more specific I have two different apps on my phone that can tell me what a colour is I do retain the memory and it will read aloud the label and and what the colour is and I tend to use three or four colours together and then yeah just gesturally and in a very abstract expressionist way create but but presumably um, you didn't expect this to be picked up by a clothing company not at all no I just did it for myself and to finish my degree to start with and uh, and now I do my postgrad master's degree at the Royal College of Art this is not so much on the magazine but really how you deal with your own fashion Jessica how much do you have to depend on sighted people for your you know your ideas about fashion about what suits you matching outfits colour palettes you know all that sort of thing because a sighted person will probably just say oh yeah that suits you but you have to trust them presumably absolutely I found that more and more with regards to clothes I've become a lot more independent especially during the pandemic and being forced to to have to shop online I've found a strategy with clothes with certain websites they have descriptions which helps me in my decision. I tend to pick a lot of cohorts, so matching bottoms and tops, or I would go for jumpsuits because that's a one-piece outfit (laughs) or a dress, which is a one-piece outfit. When it comes to makeup, that's a little bit harder because as a black woman, already there is not a lot on the makeup market for my type of skin tone. I mean, it is one thing to read this magazine as a novelty. I just wonder how much do you think you'd get it regularly? At the moment, we're told it will be produced for a year in Braille and audio formats. So I guess that's a sign that they're looking to test the market in a way. Do you think there'll be a demand for it? Having been the first ever person to complete the bar using Braille and now becoming the first ever person or the first ever blind person to appear on the first ever Braille issue of Vogue, it it just seems right to continue to support it because I am very passionate about people learning Braille and I do hope that in this very digital society, more visually impaired people stop to actually make time to read Braille and I do also hope to promote Braille so that in the future it can be become part of the national curriculum so it's definitely something that I will I will be pushing one more question Jess did they let you keep the dress they didn't oh, really <laughs> shame on them didn't. well look, thank you both very much indeed Jessica Inaba and uh, Kimberly Burrows thanks for coming on if you'd like to read it uh, you can either be sent the audio file which you can then braille at home for free or to register your interest in receiving a physical braille copy you can email accessible vogue at Conde Nast, that's C-O-N-D-E-N-A-S-T dot co dot U-K. And that email address is on our website. And now for another remarkable woman, American disability rights lawyer Harbin Germa has the dual disabilities of blindness and deafness. She's in fact totally blind and profoundly deaf, but it's never stopped her from doing what she wanted like being the first deafblind person to qualify from the prestigious Harvard Law School. And she's described her dual disability as an opportunity for innovation. But recently, 
on BBC World Service, she's been reflecting on a few unexpected access issues at the British Museum. I had no idea Londoners obsess over canine attire. Many service dogs have neon green vests, and many guide dogs wear white harnesses with large neon signs. But UK and US laws don't require assistance dogs to wear specific colors or textiles. In America, we have over a dozen different guide dog schools, and each one has a unique harness. My Milo graduated from the seeing eye, the world's oldest guide dog school. It's the training that makes a guide dog, not the outfit. The officer not only lets us in, but invites us to skip the queue. Queue hopping sparks heated debate in the blind community. We want equality, not special treatment. Deaf blindness doesn't prevent me from standing in lines. And normally I do, unless someone insults my dog. Inside the museum, I approach an exhibit. Milo stands patiently beside me as my fingers glide over an Egyptian foot. Signs throughout the room prohibit touching. That ban is for the sighted. Only blind people can touch ancient treasures. I continue through the museum, delighted in all the history at my fingertips. This large sculpture, the sacred boat of Queen Mutemnia, is from 1400 BCE. Striving to read the stories, I gently slide my fingers over this tribute to an Egyptian queen. Suddenly, jab, jab, my arm gets stabbed by an angry finger. Milo looks up in alarm. The person furiously gestures at the don't touch sign. I don't see them, of course, and turn back to the sculpture. A museum employee stops the raging sighting explaining that blind people are allowed to touch exhibits. Sadly, sighted people harassing blind people, grabbing and pushing us, is not uncommon. If I may offer a suggestion, the museum should block entry to sighted people. They're quite poorly behaved. Not only that, turning off the lights and accommodation for sighted people would reduce the electricity bill. Think about it. In all seriousness, sighted people need to stop making assumptions. Many disabilities are not visible, and some visible symbols, such as guide dog harnesses, appear different around the world. We shouldn't have to dress a certain way or carry a specific symbol. Museum visitors playing culture police may end up hurting someone. Touring the British Museum is still one of the highlights from my trip to London. They have informational books in braille, large print, as well as audio guides. Inviting us to touch ancient art remains a rare gift. Only a few museums around the world do this. But it's my hope more will follow. The very individual perspective of deaf-blind Harbin Germa. And that's just about it for now, except that uh, we need your help. We're planning a programme soon on accessible holidays and we'd like your thoughts and experiences on what kind of holidays work best for visually impaired people and how to make the best of them. And uh, you might like to throw in your ideas on what to avoid also based on your experiences. You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk You can leave your voice messages on 0161 836 1338 and you can go to our website bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch from where you can download the latest and previous editions of In Touch and you can also find the ways to get in touch with Vogue. From me, Peter White, producer Beth Hemmings and studio managers John Benson and Phil Booth, goodbye.